Videos like this are made possible by the generous support of patrons like NX74656. Thanks, NX. Hello, Penguinards! I'm the Beardy Penguin, and welcome back to For All Kerbal Kind, kicking off today's episode in May 1966 with the launch of Sviet 29. Now, this is another attempt to get a satellite into geostationary orbit, as our previous satellite overburned its engine a little, as it was carrying a large WeatherSat payload and didn't quite manage to insert into the correct orbit, although it is in still a useful communications orbit, and we actually end up relying on it a few times throughout this episode. Now, we're achieving this by simply not trying to complete a contract this time. Not only do the contracts pay a pitiful amount of funding at this point, but also we just don't need the money and we do need a better communications network. We've been relying on aging Sviet satellites in all sorts of strange orbits and their solar panels are degrading and we keep having black spots in our communications network. We keep losing communication at critical points in missions. Not only that, but also we're entering into a partnership with the newly formed European Space Agency. They're going to be launching from Kourou in French Guyana, and so they need communications over the Atlantic Ocean, so we thought we would help out by providing them a satellite in geostationary orbit. Now this first one is going into a longitude just east of the Baikonur launch site, such that we can keep communication with something that we launched from Baikonur all the way up to its geostationary transfer orbit injection, so our future satellites should have an easier time of getting to these orbits. This first one uh, had to wait for a few orbits until there was an adequately positioned ground station for it to do that injection burn. But in the meantime, before we launch the other two satellites in this initial constellation, we have some more exciting things planned. You may remember the KE-50 Grum. Now, we last flew this thing in episode 14, all the way back in October 1963. This is a rocket interceptor, a real-life concept based on YE-50, which was a converted MiG-21. Now, we used this originally to fly above the 40-kilometer boundary because that was the only place that we could actually get any science. However, things have changed. As I'm sure you're aware, we're in a new install, and there is a whole bunch of new crude low altitude science that we can gain. So I thought we might as well brush the cobwebs off of this thing, get Andre Kerman back in the pilot seat and take it for a spin. Now we have updated it with a whole bunch of new stuff we've got in our new mod pack. We're actually using the correct engine. We now have access to the R11 turbojet that the MiG-21 actually used. So instead of using a French engine, I believe we were using, we actually have the correct engines on this aircraft. We've also upgraded the S-155 rocket engine so that we can get a lot more thrust out of it and also considerably longer flight time. So we're going to be cruising and trying to get as much of that supersonic flight science as we can. Although we can't complete all of that in a single flight, we are going to have to launch a few of these. Now, in future episodes, I think I might develop a MiG-25. The first prototype of that did fly in 1964, and the Fox Bat is pretty iconic. It could fly up to Mach 3.2. It was designed to intercept the SR-71 after all, and well, I believe N9 might have an A12 in the works, but we've yet to see that in an episode. Now, this would theoretically be capable of intercepting it if launched at exactly the right time, but obviously a rocket-powered interceptor is just not able to maintain those kinds of speeds for particularly long. Now, we used this just to launch Andre above the 40-kilometer mark previously, but yeah, it's maintaining a supersonic speed for a reasonable amount of time, but definitely not long enough to catch something like the A-12 or SR-71. And of course, our intelligence services may be getting wind that the Americans have an aircraft with such capability. But in the meantime, we're just enjoying the beautiful views that we get of this, though I say so myself, rather beautiful aircraft. And this craft file is now available on the Patreon. I've updated it to the modern version. I had to change the fuel tanks and the wings and the front intake as well. So a few different things to get this working, which of course all messed up the center of lift and the center of mass. But this is considerably easier to fly now. We're using atmospheric autopilot. Now we're not using the autopilot function of that, but the fly-by-wire system is vastly superior to stock SAS or even the MechJeb ASS.
Unfortunately, I didn't really look at quite how far we were traveling from Plisetsk, so it turns out that we don't actually have enough fuel to get back. So for the third time, Andre is going to have to ditch this thing in a field. The thing is, this is doing considerably less strenuous <laughs> missions than it was before, so we can definitely pack a bit more kerosene into this to make sure that it can get back to the runway in future. Unfortunately, I did accidentally arm the parachute a little early, so it fires prematurely and Andre has a bit of a bumpy landing that I am slightly surprised <laughs> he survived. So all in all, a little bit of a shaky first flight after pulling this aircraft out of a dusty old hangar, but we all get used to flying it again as we take it out for a couple more spins in future episodes. But as I said, we will need to develop a new aircraft in order to complete the more advanced crewed science, such as sustaining hypersonic flight. So that's something you have to look forward to in future episodes. I might design those aircraft in future streams. You can see there, we've got five science from that first flight. We can get another 10 science with another two. In the meantime though, we're traveling back to the moon where Lunacod 4 has finished its research in Vavilov Crater thanks to Nikos Black Vespa, one of my patrons who pointed out that was the name of this crater on the far side of the moon and it's been completing its mass spectrometry 3 experiment for the past 90 days and now we can head on to, I was about to say greener pastures but that's perhaps not quite the right term for the far side of the moon. Enjoying Ballistic Fox's new textures. This part of the moon is strangely barren of parallax rocks. I don't really have any explanation for that. Certain areas of the moon seem to have more than others. Um, Ballistic Fox hasn't quite finished the parallax scatter configs. So we're actually using N9's sort of jury rigged and uh, repurposed configs from the Sock Kerbal Solar System, which work well enough, but uh, I believe Ballistic Fox does have more appropriate scatters in the works himself. Regardless, we travel out of the crater into the Lunar Highlands, where we have bountiful more science to collect, and we'll travel back to that rover in a future episode. Now we're heading back to Baikonur, where we're launching Soyuz 11, and you'll remember that this is needed for a rescue mission. Unfortunately, Soyuz 10 got a little bit stranded at Salyut 3, internally known, of course, as Almaz 2 in the previous episode, and Peggy and Svetlana are now awaiting rescue. Of course, that is not going to be the publicized purpose of this mission, and this is already a classified mission considering it's visiting a military space station, but the official story is, of course, that that space station's got a second docking port and we're merely rendezvousing a second Soyuz to test those procedures. In reality, yeah, Almaz 2 does not have a second docking port, although I think I might make sure that all of our future space stations do to avoid having the problems that we have on this mission. You'll see there we have fixed the fairing problem, it does deploy successfully this time, and as a result, we are actually able to get into orbit. We have just enough Delta V to do so, but I might upgrade this launch vehicle because the Delta V margins launching to these military space stations are razor thin. Then again, we might just not launch Soyuz to these stations in future. Of course, with the film return capsules, the space stations are essentially automated. The crew a little more than caretakers, and we only sent them to the station because we were trying to complete that space station contract, which even after failing and re-accepting does still provide us with a substantial amount of funding so we do still want to finish that but of course we realized with horror at the end of the previous episode that we're going to have to launch yet another space station to actually complete that so that's going to be completed by Salyut 4 a civilian space station in the next episode which we currently have being constructed. You'll notice though that we have a brand new cosmonaut flying this mission due to the top secret nature of this mission We've actually been provided someone from the intelligence community. His past is shrouded in secrecy, and of course, we have our suspicions that he may have previously been involved with the KGB, but it is not our place to question. This is Ivan Nishpion Kerman, and he is going to be flying Soyuz 11, performing a daring maneuver to bring it in close to Almaz 2 before. And I'm thankful that they have EVA jetpacks to do this. Peggy and Svetlana have to jump across from the space station to the Soyuz. You might be wondering why we just don't undock Soyuz 10. 
and that's because we expended all of the fuel in the reaction control thrusters on the station itself. So if we undock the Soyuz from the station, the station loses all control, which means the station is a write-off. We can't then orient the cameras, we can't then return the film back to the Earth, we essentially have to launch the station again. And I really don't want to have to do that. We just want to get the crew off and then we can leave the Soyuz essentially providing reaction control <laughs> thrusters for the station. And in case you're wondering whether we can simply transfer fuel from the Soyuz, well not only do we not have that kind of docking port, but also they run on different fuel mixtures. The Soyuz uses high test peroxide, whereas the station uses a hypergolic mixture of unsymmetric dimethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. So yeah, we're a little stuck and we're just going to have to do a slightly daring maneuver to rescue our crew. Although this is made considerably easier by the EVA jetpack, which we did have access to. And then thanks to the mod pack change, no longer had access to, but now have access to again. I'm very thankful that even though this mission didn't have any EVAs planned, I did decide to pack those jetpacks just in case. Svetlana is the first to travel over, our brand new gold sun visors being shown in all their glory there, as she then performs a gentle EVA. We of course can't even use tethers here because we're transferring between two unattached spacecraft, which I'm sure isn't something she signed up for, but I'm sure is plenty exciting all the same. Peggy, of course, named by Nico's Black Vespa, one of my patrons and one of our Intercosmos Kerbals from the German Democratic Republic, is next. And thankfully, they're able to transfer over successfully, undonning their spacesuits in the orbital module. And, well, now it's time for them to head home. The Soyuz T, unfortunately, doesn't have any solar panels. It is entirely reliant on batteries and only has a few days of orbital lifetime. So we're gonna have to leave the station there, but it's able to orient itself to the sun and continue its operations pretty much as normal. Now we'll be seeing that station in about two and a half years in game time when it finishes its photography experiment and sends the film back to Earth. That's presuming the Americans don't try and tamper with it. Of course, they shouldn't be aware of its true purpose, and they certainly won't be able to dock with it, but, uh, well, that certainly hasn't stopped me. Rendezvousing with satellites and transferring crew across from them is made considerably easier by that EVA jetpack and the maneuverability of the Soyuz when we had to do that back with a Voskhod, stealing from one of N9's Discoverer satellites things were a little bit more complicated and the Delta V margins were so tight it took us multiple attempts to do, but man, that was a lot of fun back in those days. Those were the pioneer days, weren't they? Now we're heading back on over to a part of Baikonur that we haven't really looked at very closely in this series. And that's because I built it after we long since stopped using our 60 and 150 ton pads at Baikonur, but there's a reason to use them. So I thought we'd head on over for this episode. This is a UR-100 carrying Cosmos-1. Now, in reality, the Soviets used the Cosmos designation for anything they wanted to keep secret, any military satellites, and also anything that failed. They tended to redesignate something after it exploded with the vague Cosmos designation so as to not admit that they ever had any failures. For example, every successful mission would come one after the other. Now, we haven't done that in this series. I've had a few people suggest that I do that ever since we launched Sputnik and then Sputnik 2 was actually only the first one to reach orbit. I haven't done that just for the viewers enjoyment and for the discussion of the series because of course you can't really talk about the Sputnik 1 failure if there are three Sputnik 1s. <laughs> it just makes the series a little harder to follow. So we'll just pretend that the Soviet government is a little less vain in the Kerbal universe. Regardless though, this is of course, as I said, a military launch. So what could I possibly be launching a Svet satellite bus into a low Earth orbit for military purposes? Well, this is part of this episode's anti-satellite test. Thanks to Carnassa, we have been receiving 
military contract to be completed within a year. So I don't know what N9's contract is and he doesn't know what mine is, but it's something to spice this series up. So we'll come back to that later in the episode. But for now, Lunacord 6 has encountered something strange on the moon. This is Surveyor 4 in Oceanus Procolarum. And unlike the previous American probes we visited, Surveyor 4 is still operating. So I thought it might be a bit of fun to drive up to the camera. Unfortunately, Surveyor 4 is positioned at a bit of an awkward angle in the middle of a whole bunch of giant boulders. And in driving up to it, the rover gets a little bit stuck. Mr. President, sir, your guess is as good as ours. We... Well, technically, no. Our feed has a 20-second delay, but... That's right. Roscosmos sent Lunica. Sir? We've been monitoring the rover for 10 minutes now. Apart from troubled navigation, we aren't suspecting ill intent. Yes, we are aware of what happened with... Right. Understood. Getting stuck on a rock in plain view of an American spacecraft wasn't exactly my intention, but we're just going to get the rover unstuck and leave as quickly as possible with what little dignity we have left. Hopefully they didn't misconstrue our intentions. Now we're going to be heading on over to our contract site and completing the final lunar rover contract and getting a little bit more science. And then, of course, continuing the same pattern as Lunacod 4, collecting as many surface samples as we can from as many biomes as we can, ready to be collected by a future crewed mission. In the meantime, we're heading on over to Rogatka for our regular check-in. And they've just completed their 90 day crew duration record, which is actually a 180 day crew duration record, but that's just a quirk of the contracts. At least it was. The new contracts in RP1 do actually track progress accurately, so I might just cheat complete some contracts so that we actually get the milestones we've been achieving. They're over 50% stress and they have 260 days to go. So it's looking increasingly likely they might hit 100% stress, which according to some of the comments you guys left on the previous episode, could cause some pretty nasty things, but fingers crossed for their safe return. Now we're going to be heading on over to a brand new launch site. You may remember I mentioned that we were working on a hazardous launch vehicle launch site 100 kilometers from Baikonur, and this is it. This is Abla Cosmodrome, and we've constructed this to launch the most ridiculous and terrifying of launch vehicles that we can possibly conceive of. Things with pentaborane, fluorine, and nuclear fuels. And the first to be launched is this. This is the R11D launch vehicle, with the upper stage replaced by four RD301 fluorine and ammonia engines. And that gives us the extra two and a half tons of payload capacity we need to launch Cometa. Now, Cometa is essentially my adaptation of the Soyuz gunship concept, and this was a very real concept, kind of an answer to the Gemini manned orbiting laboratory concept. It's a military spacecraft with a hatch in the heat shield such that the crew compartment can go at the front, and then there is a larger habitation area for the crew to have extended stays in orbit and perhaps get up to some nefarious Cold War shenanigans. And this is of course tied to the launch of Cosmos 1. The decree from up above is to demonstrate the capability of intercepting a satellite and destroying it. Now, before you leap to the comments with excitement, no, we haven't installed BD Armory and we're not going to be installing BD Armory. That mod has significant overhead and I'm not sure would really be stable with all the mods we have. And it's not really in the spirit of the series. Yes, there's some Cold War shenanigans, but no, it's not turning into Fall of Kerbin round two, <laughs> just with considerably larger distances and a whole lot more realism to make the episodes take even longer to make. No, if we start World War Three, this series would not last very long. The planet would obviously be destroyed 10 times over, but that doesn't stop us having a bit of fun along the way. So this 
is Cometa in all of its glory. You can see there the descent module is actually at the front with the aforementioned hatch in the heat shield allowing access to a much larger orbital module underneath it. The crew of choice for this mission is of course Ivan Nespion Kerman who had ample practice rendezvousing with a spacecraft earlier in the episode and Ilgiz Kerman who was named of course by Darth Malakor, another one of my deeply valued patrons. So while Ivan heads on into the habitation bay and gets a sobering reminder of the reasons they're up there, Ilgiz finds something underneath his seat and begins a private communication with Moscow. And we'll find out exactly what that is a little bit later. But in the meantime, we need to, of course, rendezvous with Cosmos 1. You'll notice that we have two massive missiles bunted to the side of the spacecraft. Of course, we don't have access to any guns, so we needed to improvise a little bit. These are loosely based off of the R4 air-to-air -air missile that was used by the Soviet Union in this time period. Of course, we have adapted them for use in space with omnidirectional RCS ports and more sophisticated avionics. And there is our target clear in sight. Cosmos 1. It's almost a shame to have such a beautiful spacecraft newly launched with all that communications equipment just for the purpose of blowing it out of the sky. But Kessler syndrome, what's that? Donald Kessler hasn't even written his thesis yet, so I don't think we need to worry too much. Not that even modern day Russia even cares about Kessler syndrome. They performed an anti-satellite test while I was doing my space environment module at uni, which was a perfect case study for exactly how not to take care of the orbital environment. However, we're not just going to blow it out of the sky. In fact, Ivan is going to demonstrate a whole plethora of different satellite interception techniques, beginning with EVAing over to the spacecraft and planting some dummy charges. And it's at this point that Ilgiz begins openly talking to Mission Control. Ilgiz found a small surveillance device that Ivan was attempting to conceal on his person, and after days of private, hidden communication with Ground Control, his worst fears are confirmed. Ivan is a CIA spy. Instructions from Ground Control are clear. Under no circumstances is Ivan to re-enter the spacecraft. So how come we're so certain that Ivan was a CIA spy? Well, I'm sure that any native Russian speakers in the audience will already have noticed that his middle name, Nishbion, literally translates to not a spy. And also, he's actually an intercosmos Kerbal. He was planted into my cosmonaut core by N9. N9 actually parted with real money to become one of my patrons and demand that I put a CIA spy on one of my missions. He had no idea what kind of mission that Ivan would be sent on, but I thought that it would be appropriate to kill two birds with one stone, so to speak, and launch him on a few classified military missions, namely this particular mission that I was set by Carnassa. Now, N9 will also have a secret military contract to complete in 1966. I don't know what that is, but I'm sure we'll see in the coming episodes what shenanigans he gets up to. But as it stands, these are our shenanigans for the year. So the rest of 1966 is going to be a little bit more run of the mill. Although we have now demonstrated this capability, we may well be seeing the committer in the future, or perhaps we'll be developing the much larger and much more capable TKS spacecraft to travel to our Almaz stations. But that will be in a future episode. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. I do hope you've enjoyed. 
I'm the Beardy Penguin, and I will see you all next time. A massive thank you to my patrons and donators for their generous support, and an extra special thank you to the amazing steak, Dakota Clark, Olaf Hammerhand, Madsor, Peter Lushtinets, Simone67, Lady Lagzalot, Scott Milligan, Jesse Smith, NX74656, Jordan Millwood, Frosty Moon, Luna Nicole the Fox, and Mr. Bluestar.